Now it's time for our final guest, Dr. Kailash Nath. He has a PhD in Artificial Intelligence and Computational Linguistics from Middlesex University. He has been the CTO at Zeroda since 2013, where he co-founded its tech arm. Zeroda is now the largest stockbroker and one of the largest fintech companies in India. He has been a hobby software developer for close to two decades and writes codes every day building technology at Zeroda and building and contributing to open source projects. He co-founded and volunteers at the FOSS United Foundation, a non-profit organization that promotes the open source software ecosystem in India, and Rain Matter, an initiative that works on climate change projects. So please welcome our final speaker of the day, the software maestro, Dr. Kailash Nath. Uh, good evening, and thank you for the super long intro. Uh, so, the, Rohan, uh, who invited me here, he was, as I walked into the campus, he asked me, he, he said to me that he completely didn't expect me to come at all. But I was telling him that the butterfly effect, which is the theme of this year's uh, conference, is something that I hold very close to my heart. Uh, it forms a significant part of my worldview. And I'm, I'm, a, I'm a tinkerer, I'm a technologist. So I've tried to conflate both and I've tried to articulate my worldviews uh, in the context of technology, tinkering, building stuff, and of course how the butterfly effect really shapes all of it. So that's what this talk is about. So uh, I'm, an, I'm an absurdist. Absurdism is a worldview where fundamentally, you, you realize, you, ac you accept that there's no inherent meaning, uh, grand goals, grand plans, or grand meaning in life in general, and that life is uh, absurd, chaotic, random. And you navigate that randomness with, with whatever faculty and tools that you have, and you try to carve out your own meaning. And I've been a tinkerer, a software developer for a very long time. I, start, I started out when I think I was in my early teenage. My first open source project, I published it uh, in the year 2001. And I've been tinkering, writing code pretty much every single day, building open source projects, hobby projects, uh, practically on a daily basis for the last two decades. And personal projects that I built decades ago still reverberate today, which really is what the butterfly effect is all about. So I'm pretty sure this has been spoken about here already. Uh, the world really around us is completely chaotic. It's absurd. The fact that I'm here today, uh, when Rohan, I think, emailed me several months ago, uh, that email didn't go, to, go into my spam box. If it had, I wouldn't have been here. So it was just one tiny coincidence of me looking at the subject line, the butterfly effect catching my attention, and you know, us conversing my being here. So just a teeny tiny example, an anecdote, but that is really how the world really moves forward, one tiny coincidence at a, at a time. But it's not really one, it's trillions of things that happen every single second. Things are built, things are destroyed, people speak of stuff, people converse, people fight, stuff happens, you know, nature changes its course every given second. So to even think that there are grand plans, that we can make grand life plans and execute them over a very long period of time seems a bit absurd because so much of everything that happens is just uh, random. And I'd like to come to software, which is, what I'm, uh, which is what I'd like to talk about. Software, engineering, tinkering, this is, what I, this is what I do every day, this is what I like. And, you know, complex software, changes frequently. And every tiny change to a, let's say, a large code base of a complex system has reverberating effects that will show up decades from now. That one bad library or that one bad integration, that one edge case that was embedded in a code base 10 years ago might rear its ugly head today. And, and what else is built upon 
layers, you know, layer after layer, with each layer adding indefinitely more complexity. And I couldn't really think of too many things. Society is one, civilization itself is one, and software in that way is, is very similar. Every layer that you add increases its complexity practically indefinitely. And I'd like to cite some anecdotes. So philosophizing is one thing, summarizing is one thing, but you need concrete anecdotes to make sense of, say, the butterfly effect. So I, I had technology at Zeroda. Zeroda is a financial technology and services firm. Uh, we've been around for like 13 years. Uh, we're pretty large in our industry today. And uh, there was this, I think, almost a decade ago in 2014 when we weren't really a tech company, we were trying to transform into a tech company. We figured that we had to build our own investment platform. Uh, today, any financial service provider has an app, uh, has a web app, has a mobile app. It's the de facto standard. But 10 years ago, that wasn't the case. You could just do phone and call and trade and whatnot. So when we decided that we we were to build a, an investment and trading platform, we got around to we got around to building it. So we're working on a simple backend, uh, HTTP backend, nice clean APIs, and for whatever reason, we've, we put in a lot of effort into designing clean APIs. We also documented it, wrote nice, clean documentation. And that itself is a bit of a coincidence, you know, small little branching of the timeline because there were only two of us in the team. So you didn't really have to write nice documentation. But for whatever reason, we ended up doing that for ourselves. And then uh, what happened was, as we were building this, before we'd even published our first ever piece of technology, our trading platform, our investment platform, uh, we had this random thought. The documentation is nice, the APIs are clean, why not just open it up to the world? And this is an industry where there was practically no technological innovation happening whatsoever. This is an industry, pre in the pre-smartphone era, people weren't really trading or investing online anyway. So opening up APIs to offer investments as a service in itself was a niche, was a novelty. But we had all the pieces there anyway, clean APIs, documentation, so you know, why not? So we did that and things changed rapidly. And, and that spin-off was purely because we had good documentation, good APIs, nothing else, no business plans, no strategies, nothing. And that kick-started Rain Matter Fund. Uh, it's a fund that we operate today, it's a, it's a startup and technology fund. It's grown significantly. We've invested in over 100 startups at this point. But it kickstarted the fund because suddenly we had a couple of people show interest in our APIs. And we're like, good idea, we'll fund it. And Rain Matter Fund happened. And then it just took off. This whole investment as a service, investment APIs as a service became a thing. It became practically a whole industry, a whole ecosystem. And that really changed the trajectory of Zeroda over the coming decade, shaped Zeroda in a sense. But none of it was planned. It was literally you know, two developers sitting together, writing documentation, designing APIs. And another anecdote that I'd like to cite, and this is a personal project, uh, one of my longest running projects. So around 2009, 10, when I was in the university, I'm a, I'm a Malayali, I speak Malayalam. Uh, I was, frustrated by the lack of a decent quality usable English Malayalam dictionary online. There were a few riddled with ads, spam, and uh, you know, one day I lost it and I decided to just build one on my own. And I think I typed up several thousand words to seed the dictionary, and Olam, the dictionary was published in 2010. Small little open data dictionary, open source project, which I built for myself because I had this problem, I was super frustrated by it, and I wanted a solution. And because I got into it, I, I started using it, others started using it. it, the idea of an open dictionary, it constantly rang in my head. And in 2012, I stumbled upon this one massive file with uh, I think some 200,000 entries that uh, a person named KJ Joseph had typed up in the late 90s and dumped on a Yahoo group. It had been lying there for a decade, uh, more than a decade. I stumbled upon this. And I was shocked, you know, a person in his 80s who taught himself to type had typed up an entire, typed up and digitized an entire dictionary. So I took it, I got in touch with him, I took it, I integrated that into Olam and the dictionary grew. And ever since this whole idea of Indic open data digital dictionaries, they've been, you know, playing in my head. 
And I keep having these conversations. In 2018, right here in Bangalore, I was lamenting about the lack of a open data, easily accessible Kannada dictionary. Somebody overheard that conversation and that one thing led to another and we came across V. Krishna's work who'd spent 40 years creating a Kannada dictionary from scratch, again with almost half a million entries. He very graciously open sourced it and you know, we launched another open data, high quality open source open data dictionary. And I think Alert today is probably the largest, perhaps the largest and definitely the only open data dictionary out there. And cut to 2023, come across another person who's in his mid 80s, who's created a dictionary over 25 years, which has you know, four different languages in it. And cut to 2024, practically last month, we come across someone, a retired person living in Bombay, who's made a dictionary with two million entries over a period of 25, 30 years, as a hobby, purely as a hobby. And it's perhaps the largest open data, open source dictionary in the entire world. We're trying to take it online. So that one little, you know, bit of, uh, that moment of frustration in 2009, where you channel your frustration and annoyance uh, at a problem into something a little more, something a little creative, you know, tinkering, building something, creating a dictionary. That has spawned a series of, you know, that's caused the timeline to diverge and branch in a series of ways. Tons of things have come, come out of that project, you know, uh, ML phone, Kane phone, these are all language algorithms that have come out. Digpress has a whole piece of software for publishing dictionaries. All these dictionaries that I spoke about, that one tiny decision <laughs> fueled by frustration, it changes, you know, it's changed timelines. And today, all of the dictionary, uh, it's free, open source, freely available. It has 2.2 uh, million monthly users. So, thank you. So you can imagine millions of people who derive value from a simple utility that someone makes and gives out, you know, a product of tinkering, hobby and passion. Uh, imagine how millions of people deriving value from it, their timeline slowly changes. You, you know, you look up words, you use it every day, you use it in your profession, you use it to study, whatnot. It, it changes the timeline, it cha branches the timeline for them. So change is really key here. If you want opportunities to show up, if you want positive outcomes to show up, you have to induce change. You can't really engineer outcomes. You can't just start a startup and expect it to flourish and be successful in the next five years or 10 years. 99% of all startups fail. 99% of all pro projects fail. Uh, but unless there is change, there's no odds that improve. And without odds, there's nothing. If you're static, you know, nothing comes your way. Uh, no opportunities ever arrive. And uh, Linux is something that I always think about, uh, hobby, little, tiny little hobby project, which was the product of a coincidence. Again, frustration with Minix's licensing uh, when Linux was in the university 30 years ago, and it's changed the entire world. It's changed humanity forever. You know, that one moment of frustration saying, this sucks, let me go, you know, try and build something. And if you trace back the history of things that have changed and shaped humanity and history, really, you'll probably end up with that, you know, one tiny moment. You'll probably end up at that tiny moment where frustration leads to creativity. You know, you tinker, you induce that tiny change which reverb reverberates through timelines. So uh, when it comes to coming back to software in general, and that's what I'm focusing on here, software and engineering, uh, technical debt, uh, if you deal with large complex systems which are old, there's a lot of technical debt craft that's built over a long period of time, legacy, it's, it presents a lot of uh, opportunities. Technical debt is an opportunity. This is something that we experience pretty much every day at Zerodha in the work that we do. Stuff that we built 10 years ago, a lot of that is probably not really optimal. They don't fit the time. So you go back, you service it, you, you, service it, you change it, you tweak it. And that change creates, lays the foundation for the next, you know, next layer, for the next kite, kite connect to, to happen. And every change, every positive change, you know, diverges the timelines. It's, it guarantees nothing, but ever so slightly increases the odds of something good coming out if the change is good. And this is something that I, th this is a, 
this is a very important philosophy that i follow my entire mental model is really based on this uh, frugality and not in the sense of uh, saving resources or you know uh, imposing artificial constraints but the right trade offs uh, making the right trade offs with resources but having an outlook which is frugal when you build something when you write software when you build complex systems or when you build hardware when you build your business keeping things as simple and clean and lean and optimal always pays off uh, you know when when i was first went online in i think the year 2000 i remember that on a system with a mere 16 mb of ram there were sophisticated entire sophisticated suites of software that would run you even had 3d games that would run entire games with multiple levels that would run with 16 mb of ram today you open a static website it requires 4 gb of ram just to render it loads 10 you know tens of mbs worth of assets the computers have become exponentially faster smartphones are 100x faster than the first computer that i used say you know 23 24 years ago and yet software has become slow bloated so that doesn't really compute right it makes no sense and i think that's a big philosophical pitfall that we collectively as people who build and engineer technologies have fallen into uh engineering problems uh te- computational problems technical problems are solved by through solved with resources and the uh, the more resources you have the more innovation bloats to occupy and f- uh, fit all available resources so if you if you have a frugal outlook then you don't start out with a perspective of resources first you start from first principles you're building hardware you're building software you make it as optimal as possible as lean as possible you don't really care about how much resources resources are available to solve that problem you solve it using first principles keeping resources aside and yeah i think uh, every engineer every tinkerer should learn to despise software bloat to reject software bloat and never really accept mediocrity in terms of stuff that is built uh, a static website which is 10 mb is just not acceptable it should be rejected and yeah so uh, at at zeroda for instance these things being frugal with technology matters every single day uh, today happens to be today saturday uh, happens to be a market day we are functioning today in one of those rare Uh, instances where suddenly there's a circular saying you have to open markets tomorrow and you're open and you have millions of users who log in every single day there is a million and a half people who are connected to let's say live market data streams these systems are still running on the back of decisions that we took a decade ago uh, 10 years ago when we only had i don't know 10000 users today we have 14 million users we decided that when we stream market data and prices we will save every single byte because we don't we don't want to waste the users uh, end users bandwidth so when we stream infosys is price ticking from one point to another it's four bytes a simple you know a packet of four bytes binary that decision that we took 10 years ago and there was no reason to have done that we never envisioned reaching uh, the scale that we are at today there was no reason to have done that we could have done like a large json payload and what not but it was the right thing to do saving bandwidth for the end user and there were no resource constraints because we only had 10000 users but that decision is what has enabled us to scale to 14 million users efficiently when it happened and we couldn't have predicted when it would happen but those decisions are the backbone of today's zero da and that's just one there are hundreds if not thousands of such tiny decisions of optimization that we did 10 years ago that are still holding us together today yeah so when i speak of frugality i refer to the spirit of frugality frugality as a principle as an outlook and not frugality Uh, as a constraint on money or resources or whatever it's it's a principle that one uh, uses as a tool that one uses when building creating and tinkering so can we engineer these little butterflies from a decade ago that you know 
uh, flap their wings a decade later, help you succeed as a startup or a business or uh, as a tinkerer, as a hobbyist? Absolutely not. You can't really engineer success in that sense. But you can change. It's possible to induce tiny positive changes. And with the understanding that every tiny positive change has a probability of creating some positive impact. Could be this big, could be orders of magnitude big in the future. So that's, that's really the gist of it. Uh, you can't predict the future. Uh, at Zeroda, we had no clue that we'd grow so big. You know, COVID, the, when the pandemic happened, it was destructive to humanity as a whole. It was destructive to many industries, many enterprises, but stock markets boomed. You know, it's one of those black swan events, once in a century or quarter century sort of an event. So that we were able to, as an organization, we were able to, we were able to capitalize on that boom because we had all of these little pieces, all the right positive butterflies in place from a decade prior that we'd done because it was the right thing to do, not because we knew that in 2022 COVID would happen and you know, massive scale would happen. So that's it. I mean, who knows what happens next? All you can do is induce that tiny positive change and just hope for the best. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So the stage is now open for a question and answer session. Uh, we have time for only two questions. Uh, nice to meet you in person, Kailash. Uh, first one is that last month, uh, there was a tech leak happened, right? And uh, it's not the first time. It happened like, uh, I remember three to four times. And uh, since, you know, you are into broking industry, it means a lot of money, right? We are dealing with money. And so many customers, uh, you know, got frustrated. And even I was one of them. So how are you mitigating this? Because technology, you know, we can't avoid anything and it happens anytime. So tech is always meant to fail. And how did you handle the situation? And uh, how are you mitigating the risk in future? See, any large complex system which is ever growing, like the industry itself, is prone to issues. And these extreme edge cases are the most unfortunate. You build resilient, robust systems. You think of 100 things or 1,000 things that can go wrong, but the, it, it could be that one edge case on one day that triggers a certain thing that was never envisioned. So when that happens, depending on the resilience of the system, you're able to reduce the impact. So we, the incidents that we had, two incidents that we had, they affected, thankfully, only a small fraction of the customers, which and it would have been bad for those customers for sure. And the effects lasted short bursts of time. That is all the result of massive amounts of engineering. Rather than an entire system fail and everybody being affected, you're able to contain uh, uh, problems, contain issues to isolated groups and minimize the, minimize the interval of those issues. And this is nothing, this is not unique to the stockbroking industry. This is how all systems are built everywhere from your Google to your banks to, to absolutely everything. I mean, something like that goes wrong, you, you go back to the drawing board and you address that edge case. And the next time, the probability of something similar happening goes down drastically. So it's a never-ending process. And the industry itself is not stagnant. If you only had, let's say, a million users who had the same behavior, it wouldn't be a problem. You wouldn't have issues. But the industry grows massively, uh, especially in stockbroking where Every second matters, where every second can induce massive changes that you've never seen. Like the day COVID lockdowns were uh, announced, uh, and two weeks later, what happened, the kind of activity that we saw, unprecedented in the history of the industry itself. And yet your systems have to be ready for that. So it's a never-ending exercise, maintaining and building any large complex system. Nothing to do with stockbroking in general, but any large complex system. So we work practically 24-7 to make systems robust, and we do our best with competence. And I speak for all engineers everywhere in all organizations, all competent organizations, and not just this industry in particular. Hi, Galash, and uh, Zeroda has been an inspiration for me and for the youth of this country. And my question is, uh, what's your conviction and vision when you started uh, Zeroda as a tech firm in 2013. Prior to that, you've been uh, 
offering your services in the orthodox and traditional uh, brokering services, right? So what was your conviction and vision? Is it to make sure, uh, to make sure the customers get the ease in terms of trading or is it to, is it for the future India to make sure that you have financial inclusion in place? Is it, is it uh, a kind of uh, vision, uh, vision that you have uh, exploded? It's all of that. Vision changes. The landscape in the industry 10 years ago is completely different from how it is today. In the beginning, the goal was to make investing easy and accessible to everyone. But today, the industry itself has evolved. Uh, there's Zeroda, there are so many other organizations who offer similar well-built products and services. So as Zeroda, our goal today is a bit of everything that you've said. Uh, it's the, the UI, the pricing was or over. Everybody, every service provider offers the same pricing, similar platforms. So you keep improving platforms, but the idea is for us, the, our main goal is now to help people do better with their money. Uh, so it's an evolving goal. I mean, as the landscape changes, as markets change, as society changes, every business's goal will also keep evolving. So I have several so i have several personal projects and the dictionary is an ongoing one so what has been bugging me in this context is that uh, india has massive linguistic diversity i think every state barring the official languages there are countless you know smaller languages undocumented unknown ideally if you think about it a country with such linguistic depth and diversity should have had robust online resources for language. Every Indian language should have had a super high quality, open data, easily accessible dictionary online. And the fact that it doesn't exist really bugs me. We've been able to do uh, Tamil, Malayalam, uh, Kannada, Telugu, but there should be, it should exist for every single Indian language. So one problem that I've been trying to attack in my limited free time is to figure out a way to have high quality, open data, Indic dictionaries for every single Indian language. So there are technical projects and there are non-technical projects like this. Thank you, sir. Your expertise you. in the world of software brought invaluable insights to our audience. It was a pleasure having you. We would like to call Rohan on stage to present a memento as a token of gratitude to Dr. Kailash Nath. <laughs> 